Rima from India, Alaga from Mexico. Welcome to CCTV News World Insight. Thank you very much. What are some of the challenges facing you and your country when doing protection of ancient civilizations? Well, in India, there are lots of sites which are already known. You know, people will talk about the Taj Mahal. <laughs> people will talk about sites they know. And the government is protecting thousands of sites. But like with China, no matter how much you have protected, like with Mexico, there are so many small sites which still need protection, which are unknown, and which are then left to the local people to preserve. So the challenge there is to make sure that local communities understand how important the past is, not just for the present, but for the future. Is it difficult to do? It is difficult. The local people are willing to do it, but money matters. So if today, you know, to have a high-rise building means something more, they will not care about that little shrine which is on somebody's, that little memorial of somebody who fought maybe 2,000 years ago. Somebody fought and died. And they'll say, huh. But the old men don't. Old women and old men recognize it. But the young ones say the past is the past. We need to live in the future. I think they need to realize the future, the present, and the past are all linked. And what about you, Alga? Mexico. In Mexico, we have more than 60 languages, for instance, and, and groups of indigenous people uh, all over the country, but especially in the south, uh, southeast of Mexico. And uh, these people uh, are starting uh, sometimes to not want to speak their own languages. And we, we talk about uh, an ancient poem in the Nahuatl uh, uh, language that is from Mexico, the uh, center of Mexico, uh, that says something like that. Uh, when a language dies, uh, you do not have the manner to talk about a, a, a bird or the beauty of the sunset or the tree because it, you don't have the ways to do it. But are they going to be persuaded? How can you persuade them? Is it easy to persuade them? No, it is not, but uh, they're, they're wanting to do it. You know, we have a school uh, in the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico in uh, uh, close to a place uh, in, in uh, uh, an archaeological site. Uh, this school is exactly that. It has all the traditions. Uh, the school uh, uh, teaches languages, teaches crafts, teaches ways of, of being, of, of taking care of their elders. And this is what we have to develop in our country. But then, will one school, Rima, really save one civilization? Olga, I have a story here, a way I'd like to share with you. And this story is from at least a thousand years ago. And I think, again, it will appeal to people who are listening to me in China or in Mexico or in India. Uh, a king from very, he wasn't a king, a warrior of very humble origin. There was an attack. He became the commander. He became the king. Having become a king, he married into a very royal family and he took all the behavior of a royal. So he did not like the local language he had grown up with. And he forbade someone from speaking it. He said, speak in Sanskrit. So it's like speaking, you know, perfect Mandarin, not the local languages. His old court poet then went away because he composed in the old language. Now, with time, maybe 10 years, 20 years later, this king went out hunting. He got separated from the others and he came to a forest where there was absolute peace. And he heard this beautiful sound and he followed it. And he found that birds were sitting on the trees and there was a tiger and an elephant and a leopard and all were sitting next to each other. And an old man with a long white beard was reciting beautiful poetry in the local language. And as he recited, he was burning each leaf. You know, those long leaves of the old days. Oh. And he said, stop, who are you? Why are you burning this? This is beautiful. And the old man looks at him and he says, oh king, do you not recognize me? You forbade me to use that language. So the king realized his mistake that yes, you need the perfect language, but you need the local language. You need the imperfect and the perfect to have a harmonious world. Now, this is written about. So if this realization can happen to a king, 
I think it can happen to communities if we choose to work with them. If we can make them proud of an international culture that they belong to, but also of the local culture which comes from their heart. But people would argue, I mean, Rima, Olga, both of you are coming from well-off families, you are well-educated, you are the elite of the society. Of course you want the culture to be what it is, but for those who are living in the huts, which might be you know, there for about 500 years or even 1,000 years, they want to live in modernity. What do you make of this kind of argument? When I was in the National Monuments Authority of India, that is a choice we had to have because the rules were such that if there was a monument like this one, you know, the Imperial Palace, the Forbidden City, uh, people who were illegally there, who didn't have papers to be there, but they've been there 50 years, 100 years, they're not supposed to be there according to the government and according to law, but they are there. Because they are there, the tourists can have restrooms. They cannot because they are meant to be moved out. And so we were arguing for them to have those things. It also helps to, in our countries to be able to say, hey, listen, I am what I am thanks to my parents having gone in for education because that's where I come from. I come from where you were. So my father grew up reading in the light of a lantern mm. and he became what he is and he was conscious of his culture. So it needs talking, it needs negotiation. It also needs, which is why it is very relevant for the younger people to not only look to certain international countries as, you know, that is where we want to go because there has a better standard of life. Because you may not have it there. You need to work as hard. So if you have pride, of where you are and pride I don't mean you know just to say oh we are the oldest we are the best right. that doesn't mean anything but I am what I am if I'm poor and I have torn shoes but I'm wearing something that my grandmother made I'm proud of it compared to India Oliga you're from Mexico I'm sure there are more diversities in terms of protecting civilizations even more challenging I would assume Yes, but uh, you can communicate. You can communicate if you relate to them in their own uh, way of being, in, in their own heart, not, not from a, a high position, not from the desk that you decide on, on public policy. The uh, housing industry in Mexico has uh, wanted to make, it, uh, make uh, homes in concrete, and brick it to the to the people there, and they have had to uh, see how horrible it is to have concrete homes because it's very hot and or very cold in the winter, and and the the, the knowledge of the ancient people that have built their homes in uh, different ways, uh, in mud, in very thick walls, and very high ceilings. Things like that mm -hmm. are, are becoming, uh, again, something that is necessary to, to maintain. But the question is, how much do we know? How much can we learn from our ancient civilizations? There is no question. We can learn a lot. Are we smart enough to learn? Maybe the people are, but also at, at government levels across the world, you know, internationally, all governments, regional governments, state governments, national governments, need to know that policy making is not enough. You know, the policy maker, I know they may be in touch with the locals, but you need to be in constant dialogue mm -hmm. with people. Because if, if you want to remove my little one-room hut, and give me a huge palace somewhere, I might have an emotional connect, or I might just say, yes, I will go for the high rise. But then, you know, what happens to the old grandmother who can wander down to the local market on days when her knees are good? We forget that. What happens to the old great-grandfather who can hardly see? Mm -hmm. But if he goes down the little street he lives in, he's lived there you know, maybe all his life, there's a connect, which may not be in the high rise, which may not be in the modern materials which may not be in a lot of things. How do we choose? Who chooses? Who is the best person? And how informed should you be? Should it just be the majority decides? Right. You know, that's democratic, so will a majority decide? Will a noble leader decide? How much does it, because in the past, you had good rulers who listened, and you had good rulers who were totally autocratic and did not listen, and you had bad rulers who did the same. Mm -hmm. So how can we, 
at the, a small level and at the international level, listen, listen to our past, listen to the people around us, listen to each other, and then come to informed decisions. But have you got us some answers? No, I don't think, do you? Well, I don't. I wish we did. I wish we did. But I think we can seek for them. I mean, just, just not as a joke, but seriously, we need to think. We need to think consciously in whatever field of life we are in. But what about that ultimate question? I mean, results vis-a-vis -vis efficiency, what about short term, what about long term? You know, when policies are being drawn, all of these issues need to be taken into consideration. Well, uh, many times uh, the trade-off is tourism, for instance. We want the money from the tourists and we want them to come and see this Asian civilizations and we do not have a management plan for for uh, uh, visiting the tourism. We uh, let everyone come in and destroy our, what we wanted to, to show off. Uh, I think the, 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 the politicians need to know how to, to, un, to, to show these ancient civilizations, but without destroying the, the, the hen of the golden eggs, mm -hmm. uh, without showing, uh, uh, letting everybody come in and everybody sell things and everybody go and, and ask for money uh, and, 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 and really destroy this beauty of, in the sense of, of community. Have you seen some heart-aching examples? Yes, Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it, it is a, a horrible market. It's impossible to visit. It's filled with people selling. It, 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 you cannot see, it, they are using the Chichen Itza for uh, concerts. But some would say, isn't that nice? I mean, more people got to know this specific cultural heritage site as a result. No, because what you do is, is, is uh, make it become commercial. Uh, make it become, uh, the people will go into the Chichen Itza a space that is a sacred space, and it's still sacred for many Mayans. Uh, it, it, they, it becomes a place to have fun, to hear music, yes, very nice music, but it's, uh, you can have these uh, players uh, show, have concerts somewhere else and raise awareness, yes, but somewhere else, not, not in this sacred, very special space. I want to come back to that word you use, you know, about time. Because we look at something and we say, I know, I've heard this recently in India, that instead of preparing mortar, which takes 20 years, they say, we don't have the time for it. And I said to myself, I said, wait a minute. And I said to them, you know, people lived maybe shorter lives than we did in the past. If they had the time, why do we suddenly feel that we have to do everything in a hurry? Why does change have to come in a hurry? Why do we need to look at short-term benefits for everything? Why can we not realize that the ancient civilizations have survived because they gave, they gave the benefit of knowledge to each other. They realized that time, it takes time to do things, that short-term fixes will just be short-term fixes. So you have you know, sudden tourists coming in. In the long term, it will not keep the culture or civilization going. And you can say, well, so what's wrong with that? Let's destroy it. But when you don't have roots, your tree is not going to grow strong. And it may not matter in one generation, but it does matter. Again, what keeps coming back to our countries, you know, to China, to Mexico, to India, is yes, you know, this building is interesting, this monument is interesting, but we need to have money to make it go. So use it for something else. Why should an old building, which has already lasted its time, need to justify itself in the future it's like, you know, asking a great grandmother who has worked hard and she's carried people on her shoulders, now just wants to sit in the sun and you say, no, no, what money is she bringing in? Well, I think something, something in that thinking needs to be uh, concentrated to look for solutions 
and not just look at simplistic solutions. Well, maybe most of you don't care about the speed, but so many people around you, they do. They talk about speed, they talk about everything needs to happen fast, overnight, they talk about money, they value what is the latest rather than the ancient and the past. What can you do? Yes, definitely. I think that what we have to do is be more humble and understand that uh, the knowledge that these people can give us is much more than what we can give them. And therefore, we have to really understand and learn how to listen. And maybe for the young, uh, we have to teach them to listen. They don't want to listen. They have too many uh, uh, things to care about and to think about. Teach how to listen, how to uh, understand, how to be more empathic with, with them, with these societies, that the only thing they need is someone to hear, mm. to, to, to understand them. What can we do? It's the we. It's forums like this, where you realize that, you know, Mexico has certain issues, they're dealing with it. China has certain issues, they're dealing with it. Uh, Iran, Iraq, all the countries present here have issues and problems and together we can do. Individually, maybe you would need to be, you know, somebody really special to be able to call the shots to do it. Maybe people in the media can make a difference. So we need to just, I think, get together perhaps mm -hmm. and, and convey this urgency for this, but the importance of it. If civilizations have lasted for 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years, they will not unless we give them that importance and unless we do our bit. Well, ladies, when you travel around the world, what kind of common grounds? I mean, India, Mexico, China, some of the other ancient civilizations, do you find among them, when you are walking inside a forbidden city and many of the cultural heritage sites inside your own countries, what inspirations do they provide to you? Yes, very much, very much. For instance, uh, these past day and a half that we have been here, uh, uh, learning about what Dr. Shan is doing in the Palace Museum, this very ancient uh, place as the Forbidden City, is something that makes us understand that there is modernity can be taken into our own countries in a different way. Arima? I think I'm always amazed at how much the human mind and the human hands have been able to create. You know, physical, poetry, art, music. We've also been able to destroy. So let's hope we don't do that. But uh, I also realize the other thing, life for us as human beings is short and what has survived is the culture and the civilization which means the collective it is not the i you know i often wonder why in india they used to talk about the soul coming back many times i think it's because the idea was you can't learn enough in the short time you're on earth now i don't know if i believe in reincarnation <laughs> but definitely i'm amazed at how much we have created and i'm amazed at how much we have destroyed and I wish we could carry on with the creative part and maintaining what is there across the world and stop destroying because I don't think we can create those things anymore. What a pleasure, ladies, to have both of you on our program. All the best.